that is a very nice introduction. It's sort of not true. <laughs> Editing books is not the same as writing books. I should say that very clearly. So seven books I'm surprised by, but thank you very much for that. Thank you to Cora for helping to organise this, to Ron Brolio, who is my tour guide while I'm here, and to Ayanna Thompson, who I think isn't here today, but who helped to set this up. I'm really pleased to be here. I came from Glasgow. The weather was nice this morning, I thought. I recognised it. It felt homely. Um, it's warm now. <laughs> I was warned it might get this way. Um, the paper I'm going to give is a kind of attempt by me to think through what I'm doing with livestock. And that's what I'm interested in at the moment. I'm trying to think about uh, how people thought about their livestock in the 17th century and to think about what it means to be stock and to think about why that might be something you can think about in animal studies and why it might be necessary to do that. So that's a bit of the context, and I'll just leap in and do it. In their Dictionary of Traded Goods and Commodities, 1550 to 1820, Nancy Cox and Karen Denall record, quote, nearly 4,000 terms found in documents relating to trade and retail in early modern Britain, unquote. The objects listed in the dictionary range from the easily recognisable oats and sauce spoons to the now lost dead head, which was used for a red pigment, and scabious water, which was apparently good for diseases of the breast and lungs. The first animal object in the dictionary sits between the opening entry in ABC, a child's spelling book, and the third absinthe, or the plant wormwood, and it's abortive vellum. That is, and this is a quote, vellum made from the skins of aborted calves or other animals. It provided a soft skin with a fine grain suitable for artwork, unquote. I think abortive vellum in many ways might exemplify many animal commodities. In it, the actual animal's presence seems to have disappeared, to have been overlaid by human culture. But this is not always the case, of course. And some items in the catalogue offer another set of possibilities for early modern consumers, in which the animal is more obviously present. The last two animal entries, for example, are Yorkshire ham and young beast. Dead or alive, meat or animal, these are commodities. Do you want to come and sit? There's two chairs down the front if you're... Okay. The Dictionary of Traded Goods and Commodities affords a fascinating glimpse into a world of stuff. This is a world that's become a key area of inquiry in Renaissance studies over the past 15 years. For someone like me working in Renaissance studies and animal studies, the focus on material objects rather than on uh, textual uh, representations brings with it new possibilities and new problems. For while there's the traded Dictionary of Traded Goods and Commodities reveals so clearly, there's an abundance of animal matter to deal with in early modern England. There's also a possibility that concentrating on animals as the stuff of the market might go against one of the central tenets of animal studies, which is to acknowledge and engage with animals as active presences in the world. When this happens, when the animal is regarded as an agent, the human can be seen in a new light, as a being reliant on and inseparable from animals, to the extent that the human world can only be regarded as the so-called human world, as one constructed by numerous participants, not all of which are members of our own species. Thus the danger is that reading animal matter, rather than reading living beings or even literary animals, might only reinforce the perspective that relegates animals to the realm of inert objects. So the first way to reconcile the apparent disjunction between an interest in animal stuff and an interest in animals as active presences in the world is to note that a living animal and animal matter are not separate categories. Thus, while it's obvious that live animals and dead animals and dead animal products are not the same, assuming a distinction, say, between a cow in the field and the milk in the carton, actually obscures the reality in which milk produces cows as much as cows produce milk. And denying this entanglement perpetuates a system in which... Sorry, I don't know why I've got a picture of a cow. You all know what a cow looks like, but it's a picture of a cow. Just in case you didn't know. Denying this entanglement... I forgot what this picture was. It says four, press button. It's a cow. Denying this entanglement perpetuates a system that presents us with happy cows and commoditized milk simultaneously. But as well as this, I want to propose, and this is the focus of the paper, that animal matter can have an active presence in so-called human culture too. And in response to this double meaning, the inseparability of animal and product, the potential agency of animal stuff, I propose a term that makes inseparable an living animal and dead matter. And this is animal-made object. 
And for me, the term carries two simultaneous meanings. First, the animal made object, so the object made out of an animal. And second, the animal made object, the animal made into an object. So using the term animal made object might, I hope, allow us and remind us not only of the concurrent status of animals as both agents and matter, but also of the nature of the relationship we have with them. So as well as my use of this term, there are two theoretical perspectives that act as important lenses through which to bring animal matter into focus in animal studies that I want to briefly outline. The first is actor network theory, which offers a conception of agency that allows us to see animals as active presences without having to assert that they have pseudo-human subjectivity. Indeed, actor network theory proposes that humans themselves are simply actors in networks and that the concept pseudo-human subjectivity is meaningless because human subjectivity it do itself does not exist in any a priori sense. As John Law, uh, theorist of science and technology studies, puts it, the argument is that thinking, acting, writing, loving, earning, all the attributes we normally ascribe to human beings are generated in networks that pass through and ramify both within and beyond the body. Hence the term actor network. An actor is also always a network. In a recent essay, Bruno Latour traces one way in which such ideas about the human are resisted. He notes that the relegation of technology to the realm of means rather than ends by a large number of sociologists is underpinned by and simultaneously reinforces a conception of who it is that we think we are. In the face of the increasing autonomy of technology, he argues, the response of these sociologists is clear. It is to disengage the human from this domination uh, by technologies, as if such separation were both simple and possible. He writes, to become moral and human once again, it seems we must always tear ourselves away from instrumentality, reaffirm the sovereignty of ends, rediscover being. In short, we must bind back the hound of technology to its cage. Now, the canine image here is perhaps accidental. Latour has nothing directly to say about animals in this essay. But it's clear that this idea about technology can be usefully applied to the role of that other group of non-humans. Animals too often are bound back, absented from the picture, made to seem unnecessary and inconsequential, with the result that the human emerges as the only necessary and consequential being in the frame. And to offer a wonderfully and accidentally surreal example from the discipline of history, in his 1962 study, The Wool Trade in Tudor and Stuart, England, Peter J. Bowden refers to sheep farmers in the late 16th century as wool growers. The animal has been absented from this image as a sentient being with a mind of its own and is depicted instead as a kind of invisible and by implication virtually unnecessary plant-like organism. And because in this discourse plants don't act, they simply grow, the human is represented as the only actor. So actor network theory serves to remind us then of two things. First, of the presence of what Lucas D'Entrona has called the silent workers that make up our so-called human world. And second, of their place in constructing who it is that we are. It serves, if you like, to bring back the abortive vellum, not as mere background, but as an agent in the world. The second theoretical perspective, don't worry, the theory ends soon and we get to the Renaissance. There's a bit of theory more to come. The second theoretical perspective that I think might allow a focus on the matter made from animals to be productive site for animal studies is less well known in that field, although it is becoming used. Um, and that's thing theory. According to Bill Brown, an object is perceived to possess power and agency in the world through its emergence as a thing. He says, we begin to confront the thingness of objects when they stop working for us, when the drill breaks, when the car stalls, when the windows get filthy, when their flow within the circuits of production and distribution, consumption and exhibition has been arrested, however momentarily. The story of objects asserting themselves as things, then, is the story of a changed relation to the human subject, and thus the story of how the thing really names less an object than a particular subject-object relation. So thing theory allows us to recognise that objectified animals, that is, animals living or dead, can and should be read as having active presences in the world. They are 
asserting themselves, that's Brown's phrase, or they are recalcitrant, mine. And the Oxford English Dictionary's happily animalistic definition of the term recalcitrance is that it is a kicking against constraint. And in her study of domesticated animals from early times, Juliet Clutton Brooks Brock writes of the, quote, erratic and recalcitrant behaviour of solitary carnivals, her example is the ferret, that cannot be tamed. So things in these terms are hounds that will not be caged or domesticated. Without human intention and indeed potentially against human intention, from this perspective the animal made object can be seen to construct new meanings, beings and relationships. It is a truly active presence in the world. So my intention in the rest of this paper then is to see whether Latour's idea that an orthodox humanist conception of being human requires us to bind back the hound of the non-human to its cage holds true in pre-enlightenment as well as in the post-enlightenment present. And it's to see if paying attention to the recalcitrance of the animal made object that thing theory alerts us to might be one way in which such attempts to contain the non-human can be brought into view. My focus here on animal matter rather than on living animals will, I hope, allow me to argue in extremis for the power of the non-human animal to effect change upon human culture even when the animal as sentient presence has been removed. So the paper begins with animal skins, it moves to human scent and it concludes with King Lear a play in which furred gowns hide all and men are forced to smell their way to Dover. Okay, that's the theory. You can relax, I've done it. So I always feel bad doing lectures with lots of theory because it's nicer when you don't, I know. <laughs> the recalcitrance of the animal-made object that makes, thing, <coughs> makes, a th makes it a thing can be traced in Peter Stalybrass and Anne Rosalind Jones' study of gloves in the early modern period. In their article, they trace out the many ways in which gloves are used to construct, contain and transport political, sexual and gendered meaning. And they turn at one point to the gloves referred to by Antonio Perez, a Spanish exile in Elizabeth's court. These gloves are used by him in an extended conceit, writing to Lady Penelope Rich in about 1560, 1595, he writes... I have been so troubled not to have at hand the dogskin gloves your ladyship desires that, pending the time when they shall arrive, I have resolved to sacrifice myself to your service and flay a piece of my own skin from the most tender part of my body, if such an uncouth carcass as mine can have any tender skin. To this length can love and the wish to serve a lady be carried, that a man should flay himself to make gloves for a lady out of his own skin. He goes on, the gloves, my lady, are made of dog skin, though they are mine, for I hold myself a dog and beg your ladyship to keep me in your service upon the honour and love of a faithful dog. And it's signed, your ladyship's flayed dog. Stalybrass and Jones write that Perez extends a trope that was already well established in classical antiquity. The lover transformed into gloves will always be near his beloved. When she wears him, he will touch her. I don't want to challenge Stalybrass and Jones's interpretation of the glove as a sexual metaphor, but I want to suggest that they miss out on a layer of meaning in Perez's dogskin gloves that can be found in the animal that is present in the animal made object. The lover is not only wishing to be a glove, but to be a glove made from the skin of a dog. As such, we might be able to see another Renaissance trope being used here, just as puns are often made between deer and deer, and between heart and heart, and the heart, you know in detective, very bad detective films, and somebody puts a gun in a drawer, and you think, oh dear, someone will get shot later. I'm about to put a gun in a drawer. A mature male deer is, um, a heart is a mature male deer or an animal with at least 10 tines. That's important. So there's puns often made between deer and deer and heart and heart in Renaissance love poetry in the period. So Perez is presenting an animal pun here. This admirer is dogged in that he is utterly faithful to his mistress. But in the use of the conceit of the dog skin gloves, Perez is not only displaying his loyalty, he is also what we might term becoming doggish. He is being made canine. 
And this, I think, is where the gloves assert themselves against humanist intent. In short, it's where the caging, the utter restraining of the hound that is present in the flaying and the manufacture of the gloves is undone and the animal made object becomes a thing. The dog's persistent presence in the gloves seems to work against rather than with the sexual symbolism making sorry in the extended conceit might be in that the extended conceit might be read not as a metaphor of fidelity but as bestializing as making unnatural the sexual innuendo and thus possibly both Perez and Lady Rich now in this period the phrase a man uh, a man uh, the dog is a man's best friend the phrase love me love my dog appears in philip stubbs's anatomy of abuses in 1583 where stubbs says that it is quote a common saying amongst all men but a dog is also a despicable and less than human creature so in the merchant of venice which is written perhaps a year after perez wrote his letter shylock mocks bassiano's request for a loan asking him shall i bend low and in a bondman's key say this fair sir you spat on me on wednesday last you spurned me such a day another time you called me dog and for these courtesies i'll lend you thus much monies now i'm not suggesting that the spanish perez knew to represent his outsider status through the image of a dog but i'm proposing that the dog in the dog skin gloves that he discusses can be interpreted as being recalcitrant as kicking against the in intention of the human the putative lover utilizes two established tropes of love poetry the sexualization of the glove and the lover as a punning animal but in doing so he also emphasizes the reality of the dog in the gloves and as a result his own body becomes just another carcass as Thalibras and Jones write in a different context in their essay, where does the skin of an animal end and the skin of a human begin? It's hard to tell. And this is the image that they're talking about. And you can see here that there's a rip in the glove and that's actually the human skin showing through in the glove. This difficulty of where the animal skin ends and the human begins, I read as evidence of the recalcitrance of the animal made object, which makes it an animal thing. The fact that Stalibras and Jones do not pursue their question in relation to gloves further is a pity because animal skin, as they point out in another study, is an interesting thing in early modern thinking because its relation to the human is a complex one. According to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve experienced shame at their nakedness after the fall and clothed themselves in fig leaves. But God replaces these. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. In their book Renaissance Clothing and the Materials of Memory, Jones and Stalibras recognise the ambiguity of God's gift. This is what they say. In making clothes for Adam and Eve, God gives them a livery. His livery is both a form of protection and a threat. Fig leaves, the clothes that Adam and Eve made for themselves, are minimal and temporary. These vegetable forms will wear out. In contrast, animal skins give greater warmth and have a longer shelf life. But they also inscribe upon the bodies of Adam and Eve the first deaths in Eden. For animal skins become clothing through the death of the animals. In asserting their independence from God, Adam and Eve clothed themselves. In reclaiming them as his subjects, God reclothes them in his livery, a livery of protection, but also a livery haunted by death. So animal skins thus mark humans as both all powerful, animals will be killed for them, and simultaneously as all frail. They need animals to be killed for them. And this paradox can be traced in two very different readings of skin in this period. So Philip Stubbs, the man who declared the commonness of the declaration, love me, love my dog, argued that animal skin was given to Adam and Eve out of pity and was thus mean and base attire, which should be as a rule or pedagogy unto us to teach us that we ought rather to walk meanly and simply than gorgeously or pompously rather serving present necessity than regarding the wanton appetites of our lascivious minds. Notwithstanding, I suppose not that his heavenly majesty would that those garments of leather should stand as a rule or pattern of necessity unto us, whereafter we should be bound to shape all our apparel forever or else grievously to offend. But yet by this we may see his blessed will is that we should rather go an ace beneath our degree than a jot above. For Stubbs, corruption in clothing comes in ornament and overreaching, whereas the skin of a dead animal marks on the human self-abasement and is thus the closest that fallen man can come to holiness. 
There is, though, another interpretation of animal skin in this period, which takes as its scriptural model not God's introduction of death into paradise in Genesis 3, but I suggest a second story of divine prophecy and human failing from Genesis 25 to 27. In the tale of Jacob and Esau, God has foretold their mother Rebecca before their births that the hierarchies of primogeniture will be overturned and that, quote, the elder shall serve the younger. That's Genesis 25, 23. Despite this, Rebecca encourages her younger son Jacob not to wait to see the fulfilment of God's will, but to bring it about himself. So at his mother's entreaty, he puts on Esau's clothes and covers his own smooth hands and neck with the skins of goats in order that he should be mistaken for his hairier older brother by their father Isaac, who, would, who quote, was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. And that's from Genesis 27.1. Indeed, in the 1568 interlude, the history of Jacob and Esau, gloves appear once again to challenge identity. Rebecca says to her younger son, I have brought sleeves of kid next to thy skin to wear. They, shall, they will be, they be made glove-like for each finger a stall, so that thy father's feelings soon beguile, beguile they shall. Jacob's aim is to trick his father in order to receive the blessing due to Esau. And he is thus like Adam, another man seduced from the right path by a woman. So in this story, animal skin marks out the fraudulent nature of the wearer. Here, Jacob is not so much a man going an ace beneath his degree as Stubbs saw the wearing of skin. He is in his disguise, an image of human lack of faith in God. The villain of the piece though is perceived to be Rebecca, who doubts that God will fulfill his prophecy. Calvin wrote of her failing at this moment, she knew that it was an immutable decree by which Jacob was elected and adopted. Why then doth she not patiently tarry until God confirm in very deed and do show that the same is ratified, which he hath pronounced from heaven? Therefore she, obscuring the he heavenly oracle with a lie, abolisheth so much as in her lieth the grace promised to her son. Rebecca appears to have agency in that she makes a man dress in animal skin. But in exhibiting this capacity, she actually undermines the very structure by which such agency exists. She questions God's authority and as such disputes the very source of human power. So Jacob's disguise with its concomitant its challenge to the divine provides, I think, a scriptural context for another early modern writer's evaluation of the dangers of wearing pelts. Writing in 1633, William Prynne took a stand against wearing animal skins and likeness, arguing that they marked and significantly produced post-lapsarian human corruption. What is this, he wrote, but to obliterate that most glorious image which God himself hath stamped on us, to strip us of all our excellency and to prove worse than brutes. Where Calvin's criticism of Rebecca is that she obscures the prophecy of God, Prynne's attack on the pelt wearer, an attack for which his ears were clipped like a sheep's, is that such dressing up obliterates the image of the divine. For Prynne, it is what animal skin does to a human and not what a human does to an animal that is important. And what we might term the thingness of the animal, the thingness of the animal pelt can be found, as Brown suggested, in the change in the subject-object relations. Wearing skin alters the wearer. The animal-made object becomes a thing asserting itself in the world and the human becomes just a mouldable body, not the temple of God, as 1 Corinthians 3.16 has it. So animal skin for Prynne is thus no longer simply the symbol that reminds us of who we are, which is Stubbs's position. It's a powerful, active thing with a destructive potential and thus has much it, and is thus much more than simply a product and thence illustration of human dominion. Indeed, I want to propose that the objectification of animals that is given form in leather cannot be taken of an it, as an iteration of human dominion at all, as it is that very objectification which produces the animal thing, which in turn changes subject-object relations in its revelation of the fragility of the human. Thinking about animal skin, as Laurie Shannon has noted, reveals human skin to be insufficient. In George Withers' terms, humans lack natural armour 
They are frail, unlike animals which are born with thick or protective skins. And because of this, the wearing of pelts becomes necessary for humans. And in this being necessary, the non-human becomes dangerously potent. The animal-made object becomes, in short, a thing. Without animals, we are nothing. But with them, we are not what we might hope to be. Now, skin's power should be regarded as both particular and general. It's particular in that wearing an animal-made object is different from, say, eating one. In eating, it's the taking in of the animal. It's ingestion that is most discussed in early modern writing. But wearing skin also reflects a more general conception of animal things in early modern writing. I want to make a large claim. Here's my large claims. The persistent presence of the animal in the animal-made object seems always to defy the objectification which attempts its absenting. So dismembering a living animal does not reduce it to a passive object. Rather, it actually produces new agents. Thus, to return to the dogskin gloves, you might say that the animal's doggedness is not simply a leftover of what has been. It's not just the residue of the living animal that's been removed or changed in the production of leather. The doggedness is actually a product of the objectification itself. And this is an assertion I'm going to illustrate by turning to look at another animal, Renaissance animal made object, and that is civet. That which we call civet is nothing else but, as it were, a superfluous sweat found between the flanks of a beast much like unto a cat. So write Thomas Johnson in 1595. A more accurate description comes from the historian Carl Denenfeld, who writes that civet is a soft, fatty, yellowish, glandular secretion formed in a discharging pocket of two sacs or perineal glands located between the anus and the genitals of both the male and female civet cat. And this is Edward Topsell's image. Well, it's an image reproduced in Edward Topsell's 1607 History of Four-Footed Beasts. And if you look there's very clearly between its leg the only important thing about the civet cat, and that's the place of the gland. So this isn't a gynecological image, this is an image about perfume. Civet is very much, in Europe anyway, a Renaissance animal-made object. For while, as Dannenfeld notes, castorium from beavers, musk from male deer, and ambergris from the stomach of sperm whales were all known in the ancient worlds as sources of or foundations for perfume, Civet was only discovered by Europeans in the mid-15th century and only became widely available as a commodity in the early 16th century onwards as colonial expansion into Africa and Asia took place. The value of the animal, like a sheep's value, lay in its continuing productivity. It was not killed when civet was removed, and this made the animal a profitable commodity. So in 1622, John Jane, a sailor, is a man of his age when he bequeaths 30 shillings to one colleague on his ship, the Charles, in his will, and then also states, also I give unto John Betchard and Nicholas Johnson, both belonging to the said ship, one civet cat equally between them. He knows the value of his Renaissance animal-made objects. So this is a man coming back from the East Indies, and he's obviously bringing a civet with him, which he is going to kind of uh, harvest, would be the word for it. And he realises that on death, he may as well leave this to someone because it's an object of value. So as with skin, civet both constructs and upsets notions of being human. Like leather, it's worn, but civet goes beyond leather. Not only is perfume put onto the human body, thus changing its external manifestation, its smell rather than its appearance in this instance, perfume also enters into the body, as does meat, but here in the form of aroma. And it's in this doubleness, I think, that the specific power of civet lies. Civet has the potential to transform the human from both within and without. And this is revealed in its impact on human smell. And I mean that in both internal and external senses, both the aroma given off by the human, but also the human ability to sense the aroma of the world. So in the first meaning of human smell, civet does not simply remind humans that um, they, like animals, give off an odour. Wearing perfume with its animal foundation reveals that early modern humans actually chose to smell like animals, and thus that the human will, which should keep the human human, seemed to work against them. 
Indeed, the early modern period is of particular note in relation to civet. Alain Corbin has found that in the late 18th century, ambergris, civet and musk went out of fashion for those higher up the social scale, that the Enlightenment brought with it a belief that animal scents belonged to the masses and they are replaced by floral scents. Just as the Enlightenment begins, we want to smell like flowers and not animals. It's very interesting. Philip Stubbs, writing 200 years before Cormain, traces this shift, thus appears to be ahead of his time when he argues that these palpable odours, fumes, vapours, smells of these musks, civets, pomanders, perfumes, balms and such like, ascending to the brain, do denigrate, darken and obscure your senses, then either lighten them or comfort them any manner of way. The human senses are obscured by sense, just as Rebecca obscured the will of God through goat skin. And to return to Introna's image, the fumes do their silent work and challenge human intent. In the second meaning of human smell, our capacity to sense the aroma of the world around us, another kind of loss of controlling power is experienced by humans. As Enola Margolis puts it, Smells pose a pungent challenge to philosophies of autonomous action. They do not remain attached to their source, nor respect boundaries, but instead display a freedom that interrupts the perceived dominion of humans, thus revealing the latter to be mythical and not real. But it's not just the power to travel beyond the rule of humans that marks the danger of smell. In the dialectic of enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno argued that when we see, we remain what we are, but when we smell, we are taken over by otherness. Stable identity is shattered by odour and perfume can thus be read as a self-inflicted wound to that superior being called the human. I think therefore I am, it seems, is challenged by I smell, therefore I might be something else. In these instances, through choice and through loss of control, civet reveals not only its own thingness, it also exposes the fact that the self can undo the self that the will itself is recalcitrance, that humans are things. This linking of the role of the senses with the challenge to a humanist conception of human status echoes concerns raised in the Old Testament story of Jacob and Esau. Where earlier I read that tale as a source of one way of thinking about the wearing of animal skins in the Renaissance, I suggest that it also focuses on human perception and its poverty and provides a link between skin and civet, my two animal things, and the human. If Jacob's dressing in animal skins marks him as false, the dim eyes of his aged father Isaac, who was once, remember, replaced by a ram, so there's another nice animal image comes in there, these also construct him as dangerously lacking in that apparently human trait judgment. Indeed, the trick Jacob plays on Isaac is not an abuse only of his father's blindness, but of his other senses too. So Isaac's sense of smell is deceived because Jacob wears Esau's raiment, with Isaac, which Isaac sniffs to check the veracity of the body before him, as if clothing, unlike perfume, merely projected outwards the natural aroma of the human within. Isaac's taste is fooled in that the meat Jacob brings him is not the venison that he's requiring, but kid, and has actually been prepared by Rebecca and not by Jacob. It's indeed only Isaac's hearing that is true, but ironically, it is not trusted. Having touched his son, he says, the voice is the voice of Isaac, the hands, sorry, of Jacob. The hands are the hands of Esau. After contemplation, Isaac trusts touch, which was understood to be the lowest of the senses. His failing is not only that he thinks he can work against the will of God by blessing Esau, but as we know, God had already prophesied Jacob's rule over his older brother. It's also that he has faith in the tangible rather than the intangible. The story of Isaac and Jacob is not the only place such a linking of an animal thing and the failing human senses might have been encountered in early modern England. This dangerous lack experienced by a father who fails to see his true child in a story replete with references to the human senses reappears in a number of ways in Shakespeare's King Lear, a play which should be read as a repository for some negative contemplations of the nature of the human and which was, of course, written by the son of a glover. The subplot, a happy day when somebody said to me, you do know that Shakespeare's like, yes. <laughs> The subplot of King Lear contains a key parallel with Genesis 27. The letter that seems to reveal Edgar's parricidal desires that Gloucester's given by the apparently reluctant Edmund is false, like the skin Jacob presents to his father's touch at his mother's bidding. 
Gloucester asks, you know the character, the handwriting, to be your brother's. Performing his role, Edmund hesitantly states, if the matter were good, my lord, I durst swear it were his, but in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his, Gloucester replies, echoing Isaac's judgment. The hands are the hands of Esau. And the parallel is reinforced when we recall that hand in the early modern period was also a term for handwriting. In both stories, fraternal legibility and fraternal lack of judgment are linked. But the failure to tell the true child from the false is, of course, the starting point for the main plot of King Lear too. And for both Gloucester and Lear, their recognition of their failure to read their offspring leads to a focus not only on the senses, but also on the status of the human more generally. Gloucester, on seeing poor Tom, thought a man a worm. And Lear also notes an alternative conception of his own species that uses a particular set of objects to make his point. When he catches sight of the disguised Edgar, Lear states, is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. Ha, his three ons are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off you lendings. This final sentence, off, off you lendings, names clothes as temporary as not owned. And for Jones and Stalibras, it presents clothing as a mark of conflict between the human or animal source and wearer. I read this moment differently. To Lear, Edgar's apparently apparent deficiency is specific and it's general. Specifically, he's a human lacking in the use of animal-made objects in silk, hide, wool, perfume. Imagine how delighted I was when I realised there is nothing else in this paragraph. It's just animal-made objects. Um, but he is but of, because of this, because of the lack of his use of animal-made objects, he is a, and also a, unaccommodated in that he has no place. And I take this to mean that he has no place in both the kingdom and in the chain of being. Humans as Wither, George Wither knew, need animal-made objects to be who they hope they are. Without them, they are revealed as bare animals in borrowed pelts. With them, they are protected, robes and furred gowns hide all, Lear says in the following act. The animal made object, so he seems to believe, can mark and produce human power. And without such apparent markers, the king sees all of humanity as uprooted. Lear himself, utterly displaced by his daughters, of course, in fact, links regal dominion with human dominion. And it's in the face of the breakdown of both of these structures that he tears off his clothes. Here, as if to underline the power of animal-made objects, silk, hide, wool, civet, they are recalcitrant even in their absence. So in King Lear, then, clothes are no longer simply human possessions, unnoticed necessities. Necess ne oh, I can't speak. Ne it was a very long flight yesterday. <laughs> Necessities, their objects, silent workers, their necessariness is their meaning. And this makes them things which, as Introna noted, makes them disturbing. Introna states of things as we draw them on, so as we draw on them, as we draw them on would be better for clothes, they become more and more part of who we are or who we are becoming. Earlier, Leah had rebelled against denuding claiming superfluity, but on the heath, in removing lendings, he acknowledges his true place as nothing more than a poor, bare, forked animal, and as a truly weak animal at that. But this acceptance by Lear is only temporary, and between the admission that, a, that man is a poor, bare, forked animal, and his declaration that a dog's obeyed in office, a belated and somewhat Luturian acknowledgement that power is embedded in a network rather than inherent in an individual, Lear interrupts his own thought process and makes a request that must be read as an attempt to return to an order that has been lost. He says, give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary sweeten my imagination. As Andrew Hadfield has shown, King Lear is a play full of medicinal herbs, and here Lear believes against stubs, but conventionally enough, in perfumes' medicinal qualities. 
According to Edward Topsell, civic can purge the brain, while a 13th century Arab record presents it as a good and useful memory for faintness, <coughs> remedy, sorry, uh, for faintness of the heart. But civic could also be taken orally. According to Pietro Castelli, writing in 1638, when taken in wine, civet cheered the heart. All of these effects, purging the brain, remedying faintness of and cheering the heart, would be ideal for, Le for Shakespeare's aged, mad and despairing monarch. But civet also has another power. It can, Lear thinks, return to him his ability to live in a cruel world. It can sweeten his imagination. In this call for civet, for the animal-made object, Lear reveals that despite his glimpse of another kind of human, he still clings to his faith in humanity's power over the natural world. He believes that his mental clarity can be reinstated by the presence of the animal-made object, and that he can, to return to Latour, bind back the hound that he sees around and within him. There's a logic to this desire that returns us to the Bible, Genesis 2.19 states, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever animal call, Adam called every living creature, interesting slip, that was the name thereof. The animals here are utterly passive. They are brought before Adam and are named. Leah wants to repeat this naming in what you might call worldly terms. He wants to see brought before him an animal-made object that man has constructed. He wants to see human power as it is emblematized in the reduction of animal to product, the civet cat into an ounce of civet, to reassure himself that at this moment of crisis there is some order in the universe. He wants to return, return to a time when man was com in complete control of meaning and was thus the sole possessor of agency, when men were men, you might say, and sheep were plants. But of course, this is a desire that can never be fulfilled. In his objectification of the civic cat into an ounce of civet, Lear, like the sociologist Latour criticised, has assumed that an object can have no agency in itself that the only changes that it can bring about are actually changes made by humans, by the good apothecary who will mix up the medicinal simple. But Lear's faith in the power of the human to transform its world is brought up short. In King Lear, Shakespeare uses civet not as a cure, but as an acknowledgement that a cure is beyond human capacity. He makes clear that possession of an animal-made object cannot be taken simply as an enactment of dominion. The animal-made object will not allow for that. It is a thing, and its thingness can be found in the paradox that Lear's request presents. The king wants, through an animal-made object, to become human again, to become the dominant being in an ordered universe. But in this desire, Lear reveals that his conception of the human is reliant on the persistent and recalcitrant presence of the animal thing, and thus is not the human he imagined at all. This is something that is brought into violent focus in the play's final seer, scene where Lear, with awful irony, howls against what he regards as the disorderliness that makes no distinction between humans and animals. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all, he asks. All his hopes, all his humanist hopes are shattered. The hound has not been bound back to its cage, rather it has run rampant. But Lear ends the play still pulling in two directions. On the one hand, he asks for help to become the thing he has glimpsed that he is. Pray you, sir, unbutton, unbutton, the, undo this button. Thank you, sir. This is naked man, helpless in the world. But on the other hand, even as he asks that his clothing be removed, Lear is still clinging to something else. Do you see this? Look on her, look, her lips. Look there, look there. His dying hope is that there is, after all, a difference between Cordelia and a dog, a horse and a rat. He's wrong. Subject-object relations that appeared stable are revealed to be fragile. And the final moments of the play are an acknowledgement not of human agency and superiority, the superiority evidence perhaps in the king's power to divide his own kingdom where the play began. The play ends with the acknowledgement that the human is just one actor among many. 
that it is indeed the thing itself. Or to put it another way, in King Lear, a play that emphasises the importance of the animal-made object, the humanist ideal of the human as separate, as an end and not a means, is inevitably itself undone. Remember that gun in the drawer. Break heart, I prithee, break, says Kent as the king dies, the heart, the ten-timed male aged deer. We return perhaps to the world of dogskin gloves and animal punning, not only because we have heart and heart, but because the word, the verb to break is the appropriate verb to be used for carving a heart. Thus Leah, at the end of it all, is just a dismembered, mature male animal. He is, like so many deer in England, the commodity of a monarch an animal made object. He is a Renaissance animal thing. Thank you. <laughs> Just to show you the carving terms where that, this comes from the book of carving and sewing. This is the official language of carving. So if you were gonna carve a carver was a really important member of the household. This is why, I don't know, in my household when I was growing up, Sunday lunch, my dad did the carving. He never went near the kitchen and we thanked him for that. Men carve because carving is skill. Cooking is trade, carving is skill. And this is where it comes from. And one of the skills was to know the language. And the correct term for carving a deer is breaking it, yeah? So when he says break heart, you might recognise a carving term. This is my, I'm showing you this. One of my colleagues in Strathclyde saw this and he said, can I have that? That's a very good piece of found poetry. So I just, <laughs> I gave it to him. 